you're someone listening right now who struggles with this, and I have many people who contact me who say that at work, they're so self-conscious, they're hiding, they have, you know, they, they're they having a really hard time. You never owe anyone any explanation of anything that's happening to your body or your appearance. You don't need to focus on it outwardly. You don't need to explain it to anyone. Gotta stand up straight. Today we have Dr. Julie Groveman Bernstein. Is that correct? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. And uh, you are a a licensed psychologist uh, who has personally walked through seasons of challenges with perfectionism, urethrophobia, and the anxiety that accompanies it, and rosacea. In other words, you're a human and you're a human who's having a human experience. But because you're also a licensed psychologist, you can speak from a very diverse perspective. All right. So everybody, Dr. Julie, so glad to have you. Please introduce yourself and your background and your story. Who is Dr. Julie? How do you help others? Tell us about you. So good to be here with you, April. I can't believe it's been two years, but um, yeah, I think I met you when I was initially just starting to talk about my experiences with blushing and treating my own rosacea. And we were connected at a time where I was actually in a different position than I normally am. I'm usually the one helping and serving and um, listening. And I was reaching out for help for, you know, something that I'd been really struggling with. Um, I met you through Dr. Tara and it just gave me perspective of how hard it can be sometimes to be the one who really is feeling lost and really is searching for answers and wanting help in a certain area. And so I am a psychologist. I have a doctorate. I specialize in treating anxiety, specifically social anxiety, depression, relationship issues, helping people to overcome stubborn fears and build confidence and, um, I love what you said about transformative action because really helping people have their actions align with what they say they want and what they, you know, their dreams and their goals. And so, like I said, um, I was kind of humbled by my own experiences with rosacea, which really took me back to a time where growing up, I really struggled with the fear of blushing and it kind of reminded me of a similar feeling where you feel helpless, you feel out of control, you um, are kind of stuck on your physical appearance. And as a doctor, being reacquainted with that part of me, it was actually really um, an awakening of how I could help people in a different way, a little more focused way. So my work has kind of pivoted a little bit where I still specialize in treating anxiety. I um, have a private practice. I love helping people with specific fears and also just building self-esteem, building confidence, generally um, helping people with grief and loss and transitions. But now I'm actually really using my own experiences to help a unique population of people who actually, like you said, A lot of our struggles can be labeled something, but they're very similar when we really go to the core of it, the not feeling good enough or judging ourselves really harshly or being too focused on what people think about us and our appearance and the body image perfectionism falls under this with the blushing and the rosacea, but I'm really... um, I'm really focusing on this population of people now who are wanting um, help with healing rosacea or healing blushing if it's persisting. You know, there are different levels of blushing, there are different levels of rosacea, but ultimately the person I'm trying to help is someone who has tried different things, it hasn't helped them, or they're just still overly preoccupied with how their appearance is affecting their confidence or their functioning. They're not able to show up the way they want to or do what they want to do. And I'm really trying to help, you know, the missing puzzle piece, which is a lot of the inner work. Like we focus on what we look like sometimes with these concerns, what our skin looks like, but underneath there's usually something that is just not 
um, healed and, and needs to be worked through. So that's the area that I'm really focusing on in this new course that we can talk about later that I've recently developed. When we focus on fear, redness, judgment, our body image, we are, are essentially reinforcing that big, scary monster. The more we're obsessing and getting really stuck and that's where those phobias start to happen. Can you talk about what happens psychologically when we give our attention to fear? Yeah, so it's a really weird thing because if we give too much attention to fear, it feeds it and it makes it stronger and um, it really blocks us from what we want to do and it takes us out of being in the moment. When we focus too much on our fears, it's very distracting and it's limiting. So for example, when you have the fear of blushing, I know from my own experience, um, it would it would dictate how I felt, it would dictate what I wore, it would dictate what I was able to, to, how I could express myself in the moment. Maybe I wasn't as verbal or put myself out there or take certain risks. If we focus on it, at the same time, if we ignore it completely, it gets louder and louder and louder to the point where, you know, I like to say like the little I used to really struggle with the blotches really crawling up my neck, all over my face, even through my arms. It's kind of like the more I would try to push it away, it would just um, get louder, get more visible. And so we need to kind of find a balance between we're not going to just focus on it completely, but we're not going to totally ignore it because that's also it's trying to get our attention for a reason. So we want to find a balance in, in the middle. I found that for my own experience that I felt like it's like it wanted a voice. Like the more I kept hiding it, the more I kept shoving it away and sitting with it, it becomes very shameful and it just wants to speak to me. Um, you talked in our last interview about people have to meet themselves where they are, whether that means they want to talk to a therapist and whether that means they want to get some coaching or mentorship or just talk to a friend. And some people maybe just talking to themselves and admitting, admitting it to themselves and really getting in touch with how they feel. You talked about journaling as well. What do you think are some of the importance, the, the importance around either having those conversations outwardly with trusted people, or just, I never even thought about just telling yourself the truth about it and going from there. Yeah. I think anything we keep silent and we hide grows more and more power over us and there is shame there. So um, I just, I'll use myself as an example. For years, I would cover it up, hide it. Maybe I, it's funny, people notice things about us, even though we're hiding something, people see it, but it takes so much more effort to hide and be quiet about something. And in our minds, you know, I work with a lot of people who've been through trauma and, um, you know, and for my my specific situation, the reason that the blushing really became such an issue was it was a traumatic experience. The first time I was blushing in front of people, it was so overwhelming for me that I tried to, you know, put it in a box and forget about it. And when we do that with something like trauma, um, and trauma, I'm going to use that word broadly, but it's just something that's so overwhelming to your system that your body can't really process it in the moment. Your body is just surviving. And sometimes we numb out. Sometimes we leave our body, dissociate. Sometimes we run away or, you know, the fight or flight is kicked in. But in general, when we're not processing what's happening, it doesn't just go nowhere. It stays in a lot of times in our body and through our skin. For many sensitive people, our skin is communicating for us whether or not we are consciously aware of it. And even if we're trying to hide it and cover it up, it is making its way out somehow. So like you said, um, sometimes just admitting and putting words to our experience and acknowledging doesn't mean that we need to be public about it. It doesn't mean you necessarily need to go to therapy, but getting it out some way, because when we bottle up our emotions like that, it takes a toll on you in so many ways. And so, like I said, I've been, I struggled with this since I was like 13, it was years and years. So, you know, um, 
it's a long, it's a long road to be hiding something about yourself that is uncontrollable, that is just happening constantly. And it actually makes your life so much harder when you're trying to push that part of you away. Um, so journaling for me and journaling in general with something like a trauma is extremely healing because it's just getting it out, like release. Love that. And I'm a huge fan of journaling. I, I realize whenever I feel stuck or I can't get my thoughts together or I feel a lot of heaviness inside of me, but I don't know what it is. If I just start journaling, just anything, <laughs> you feel like it, it gets unclogged. Um, it's interesting too, that you talked about like how our bodies, like when we're trying to hide, because I noticed even for myself, when I, my wardrobe was high necks and today, this is just because it's actually cold outside, but, but I would wear high necks a lot. And it's, it was something that for me would visually hide that that was happening. But when I started to get into, um, my journey of healing, whether, you know, whether that meant I was going to blush or not, flush or not, it's just the, my journey of healing, which was being able to show up and not let it be so dominant in my thoughts and in my body. I realized with my self-awareness that even if it was hidden, my body would fold in. So it was like, I was still trying to hide, even though visually it was hidden and I would still fold into myself. And I thought, well, that's interesting because it's beyond just this flushing that's happening. They, they seriously can't see it. It's not, they absolutely cannot see it but I know it's happening. And so I'm still folding into myself in a very, don't look at me type of way, kind of, self, that's like a self-preservation response, isn't it? To, to fold in. Um, in yeah. Or just be tense, be very tense and not be able to be free to be you in that moment. It's funny. I had the up, I would have kind of the opposite where I'd feel very safe wearing turtlenecks or high neck. It would always be like my safety behavior that would help me to be able to show up in certain situations where I was really self-conscious, like wearing a scarf, wearing a high neck, my friends would always just like accommodate to me. If I was in a friend's wedding, they would make, let me wear a dress that was a different style than my other friend's dresses, but it allowed me to be in that moment. Um, so I have mixed feelings about it. I think that sometimes we need to do what we need to do to just show up and be at least there. But like you said, even if we're covering up, we're not possibly feeling still free to be us and to really be in the moment. And so um, I like to say, you know, it's a continuum now, you know, I think real healing is being able to go out of your comfort zone, wear things, whether or not you're going to blush or not, or flush or not. And seeing that even though it's so uncomfortable, and even if it is preoccupying, that feeling isn't going to last forever. It will pass and that you can get through it over time, you know, seeing that that can happen. That's part of exposure, which I know you are a big fan of too. I have a, a couple of videos where I talk about avoidance behaviors. And one of them, it actually says how avoidance behavior, behaviors helped me. And the, the context of that video is that they did up until, and what it was for me is that it was so overwhelming in the beginning when I first started coming face to face with it and opening up about it and creating the channel and talking about it that in that moment for me, there was no way I could just show up. So I started with looking for a medication, looking for, um, tanning products that would help kind of cut. If you, you know, have that green tint, then it can cancel out a little bit of that redness. So it was going from one product to the next. And I realized so many people were incredibly interested in product reviews because it's quick. We want something quick or a medication and people have, different experiences on medication. You know, propranolol was a big one for me. I know that that is something that is used for social anxiety. It helped. Then I realized that I would still flush if I took the medication, but I didn't care as much. It, it's like, it took the obsession away. Um, then, you know, high neck clothing, but you still feel trapped to a certain degree. Do, oh, and I was going to tell you, I was at a meeting a couple of weeks ago or so. I don't know, time gets warped, but I was with this gentleman and I was interviewing him for a position. So I was the, the hiring manager in this role. And he, I watched how he just sat back in his chair and he was so incredibly comfortable. And I mirrored, I mirrored him. I sat back in my chair and I realized how uncomfortable that was for me because this is an older man, this like authoritative, like subconsciously running in my mind that there's this older person sitting at the table 
And so I mirrored his, his body language. And it was amazing how it seemed like my body started to drop the intensity of feeling like somebody is there because I was mirroring just the, the body movements. Have you seen any correlation and even, you know, breathing through the moment, loosening your shoulders and sitting back, um, and, and getting your body to, to look more comfortable. Have you seen any correlation in, in it triggering your mind that you're safe and, and letting that go? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I first want to just acknowledge that authority is a huge trigger in general for the blushing, flushing, anxiety in general, um, feeling just like you're on edge and that that is psychologically unconsciously could have been a trigger for you, but whether or not you were mirroring him, just relaxing the body is so helpful. Like the nervous system, the nervous system, we don't even realize how much our body responds to what we think about or how even just going into that situation with an, with you were the authority, but he was older and it was a man. So that could have unconsciously triggered some anxiety for you. And so acting as if I use that term, even though it's not acting, but what would someone do if they were more relaxed in that situation? And it might be making eye contact, taking deep breaths, relaxing your shoulders, um, doing even some tapping, which you can do kind of privately to yourself or um, having a sip of water, like a cold drink. Um, what would someone do if they were feeling calmer, more confident, more relaxed? And that effect on your body does impact not only, you know, even talking slower. Sometimes we speed up when we're anxious. So talking slower, these little things, it tricks your body into thinking you are safe because you're taking slow, deep breaths. If you were not safe, you would be breathing quicker or you'd be talking quicker or, you know, so those little things do work. They are powerful. I found it so interesting because he, he was incredibly nice and kind. It's just, you could tell by his body behaviors that he was just having a conversation with me. I have healed so much on my journey that, and it's become this, this afterthought so much, um, in regards to what it was two years ago when we talked, it's more of like, I know it's, it can happen. It doesn't happen all the time anymore. A lot of that. And I've got some questions around that, but really diving into throat chakra and getting into this quiet place. Once we left Tennessee and moved to South Carolina, it's something about being in a new land. That isn't the land I was born into or brought to by my parents and being able to choose for myself where my land is feeling more included and, and just things that are probably, there are realities around it, but also when you're in the land where your elementary school is and your middle school and your high school and this job you got fired from. And that, you know, that's like having a new start was a really good foundation for me to be able to see. I was, I was referencing where does Tennessee end and April begin? Because then it would show yeah. me the next layers of where I needed to go in my healing process. But, but I found that other people and observing other people how they seem really either really relaxed and, and almost lacking awareness, or I can tell they're more afraid of me than I am of them. Like our, the way we are socially is so interesting when you are observing from an objective standpoint and not so much about me, 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 me. And the further I've gotten away from the obsession around turning red and erythrophobia and being judged, I'm able to watch what's happening around me and observe it and see how uncomfortable I make other people feel because they're having their own inner dialogue, dialogue, whether they're turning red or not, usually they're not turning red, but it, it made me feel like the, the world is just not so big. And we're so much more interconnected than, than I think we realize in your work, regardless of what the outer appearance is, do you find yourself working with a lot of people with those same root causes that, that would um, create that negative impact for somebody about, you know, I have rosacea and this is what that means for me, or I flush constantly or blush constantly. And this is what that means for me, or I have body dysphoria and this is what that means for me. Have you found like self-worth being the, the root underneath a lot of that? Mm hmm well, I want to speak to what you just what you were just saying was that when we're so consumed by some of these thoughts, 
we are not seeing things accurately with others. We're not even noticing that most people have some level of social anxiety. It's so normal. It's so you know, common. I like to say, when I sit down with someone who has social anxiety, I say most human beings are awkward. This is just a fact. We are going to be awkward. It is what it is. Like we need to get over it, right? So when we are so self-conscious, we are not able to even observe that in someone else. So one of the very first things I like to teach is just mindful awareness is being just in the conversation as an active participant rather than being so focused on our physical sensations because when you are flushing, blushing, I know for me, being hot was a huge trigger immediately, feeling warm, hot, feeling like I'm getting red. I couldn't think about anything else because that's all I was thinking about trying to prevent that. So it's so important, like you said, being aware of this is so people are awkward. Everybody has quirks. Everybody has something they're thinking about. Most of the time they're focusing more on themselves. So that's just part of being human. Um, yes, absolutely. I would say I've worked with hundreds of people with all kinds of issues, all kinds of backgrounds, every population, every age, every, you know, appearance um, that you could think of. People have money, people don't have money. Um, they could live in different parts of the world. And I would say the common denominator is uh, low self-esteem, low confidence. That is kind of what fuel, they might come in wanting to work on anxiety or depression or struggling with certain issues, but usually there is a core um, area that needs healing that is related to self-esteem. That's kind of why the one constant on my website that you can get always that's been there. The giveaway is a self-esteem guide. It's um, a free giveaway because it's something that almost everyone, even if you view someone today as being confident and people might look at you and say, wow, April, how did she get here? She has a podcast. She's, um, or she has a YouTube she has Instagram. She's doing all this stuff. Like she must be so confident. And most of the time, no one sees that it took so much to get to this point where we've had to work on ourselves a certain way. So um, I like to say that is absolutely a common theme. I find it so interesting because when we moved to South Carolina, I stumbled upon Marissa Peer. I've listened to Marissa Peer before and I, and just some of the, of her teaching in one of those was lack of self-worth. And I remember thinking like, well, that doesn't make sense because I correlate a, a, a certain type of person when I think of being self-conscious, low self-esteem, and I would not equate myself to that because I'm very outgoing and I will speak up about things. But, but then when I really got into the depths of it and followed that, that trail all the way back to little April, and I'm like, holy heck, it is a lack of self-worth. It is always looking to the outside world for, do you approve of me? Do you see me? Am I validated? And you and I talked about this in our former chat, which was that bosses, I work in a place now, you and I've talked about this, I think over the phone about it, but I work in a place now where it is incredibly safe and I emotionally safe, mentally safe. I've talked to my CEO, how I correlate a CEO with danger. And I've told him, it's not your fault. It's a me problem because you haven't done anything, but it's, it's a, it's a narrative that's running. And I would love you to help participate in my healing. And he's like, let's do it. Let's do it to re teach my body that the individual doesn't matter. It's really that worth comes from me. So what do you say to people who you hear or know are struggling deeply with a lack of self-worth and self-esteem issues to get them to get their eyes off of the outer world and back into their inner world to start that process there. I think because it's so easy to point to the outside world because we can't control that and blame and and see the things that are happening outside of us instead of taking our power back and diving deep into ourselves. Yeah, I really appreciate how open you're being about it because even if we think we make progress, we can have setbacks. Even though our actions might be different, we can still struggle with the same issue. So it also say, says that this is a lifelong journey as we take more risks and maybe professionally you grow and you have new opportunities. It brings up the same old stuff that 
even little April went through, or I know for myself, for sure, I struggled with self-worth. I don't think I had the word for that. I didn't know that's what the issue was, but my behaviors showed that I didn't accept myself, that I cared too much what other people thought, that I was, you know, um, trying to sometimes be someone I wasn't or maintain a perfection image that actually was not serving me and that isn't something that I even care about. So why would I be holding myself? You know, the self-judgment, it all, all of the healing that we can do has to do with us. It doesn't have to do with anyone else, which is so freeing. And also it's like, wow, that's a lot of responsibility that this isn't about anyone else. This is something we really need to admit is an issue and see how it's holding you back. And with self-worth, I like to think of it as you um, knowing you're good enough without doing anything different. You know, a lot of times I work with people, I'll go back to body image where they say, once I lose that weight, once I change this thing, once I feel more, you know, then I'll feel more confident. Then I can go on a date. Then I can go wear that thing. Then I won't be so anxious. And really it doesn't work that way. Unfortunately, um, most of the time, even when you do change that part of you that you're self-conscious about, or you feel bad about you, there's something else. It, there's something else you want to change. You still don't feel good enough. It's not like that. Even with ourselves, when we um, are critical about a part of us, or um, if there's a part of you from the past that you haven't healed, it keeps playing out and it's going to just show up. It's going to show up in a different way. So I like to say, you know, looking at this as it is empowering <clears throat> to know that it doesn't have to do with anything else. It doesn't have to do with your boss. It has to do with you. He could help you on the road and he, you, you could do it together, but truly this is, this is something that you have the key to, right? And so um, what's so, uh, what's been so interesting to learn is that our thoughts are so powerful. However, there are a lot of unconscious thoughts that we don't even realize we are attached to, unconscious beliefs, um, limitations that we play out without even knowing it. So I, I'm a huge fan of affirmations, but also there are meditations you can do that really target, you know, um, this deeper part of you that speak to the to like your inner child or to help you cut cords. There's something called a cord cutting meditation. I include that in my um, new course, which is they have them on YouTube too. I, I've used them a lot um, in different times in my life, but it's basically saying, you know, there are attachments we can have as adults that um, are unhealthy and that feed this negative, a negative energy within you. And so um, I'm going to back up a little bit. You said, what can we do with self-worth? How can we start to heal this part? How we talk to ourselves now in the present, like what we say to ourselves. For example, um, if you deeply don't accept yourself, don't love yourself, don't feel good enough, you really say the opposite to yourself. Even if you don't believe it right now, it's okay. Over time, what we repeat over and over again will become what we believe. But um, I like to use that phrase. If I were to love myself, what would I be doing differently? How would I be treating myself? What actions might I be taking? How would I be talking to myself? How would I be engaging with people in the world? So, you know, um, knowing that any area you're judging yourself, you feel other people are judging you, but really deep down you're judging yourself. We want to heal that by being kinder, practicing more self-compassion. Um, and just some of the self-worth affirmations that I really like, um, knowing you are worthy as you are, worthy and good enough as you are without changing anything. And when it comes down to what we're talking about with flushing and blushing and the fear of it all, knowing that you don't need to change this in order to be worthy of anything you want. And whether that's a relationship, whether it's keeping you from speaking up at work or taking that job or, you know, wearing that outfit, you don't need to 
change the appearance of it in order to do something in order to be worthy and good enough as you are. And so once we can start to really challenge it by not comparing ourselves to other people, um, not people pleasing, setting boundaries. I mean, there are a lot of ways we can start to act in alignment with someone who was more self-loving or had higher confidence or more, you know, felt worthy. There are a lot of things you can do. I realized that when I was talking to my CEO and I said, I need your help with this. It's, it's, the deep dive into the self-worth element was realizing that when I was a kid, that might've been a self-preservation thing for me. It's the way I perceived a certain situation. And it's how, I love that you define trauma because it's the what the body does with that. It's not so much when I look at comparison of my life as a child to other terrible, horrible stories that you hear that happen to other people. It's easy to compare and go, well, my situation wasn't that bad, but truly the way I perceived situations or as a child feeling like this is life or death. If I don't behave well, if I don't respond properly, I was the more outgoing vocal child. And now that I'm older and have my own children, I'm like, oh my gosh, I was totally that like just impulsive kid talking all the time. And there are things that even with my own children that I'm like, well, they may have to go to therapy for that later, but, (laughs) but this is to like literally keep them alive right now. And they can deal with how it, how they perceived it. And we'll talk through it when they get older, (laughs) if it damages them, but being younger and, and diving into that place of, wow, I was told to be quiet a lot. And when you have overstimulated, tired parents and they tell a child, go, go away, be quiet. I understand that now as a, as a parent myself, but how I perceived that as little April was nobody wants to hear what you have to say, um, be quiet, walk away. And so it started this process of shutting down my voice more and more and more, or looking at social cues, facial expressions to see, am I being perceived? Am I being, well, am I being annoying? And when I asked the CEO of of my current company to say, to say, I need you to help me with this. It is, I need you to be a CEO and I need to be triggered by you so that I can go deal with the things that are going on in the inside of me. So I like that, that you pointed out, like nobody else can do it for you. And in fact, I've seen that hiding away from any of the trigger points doesn't actually get me into a place of changing those things. It just preserves me from those things. <laughs> it's actually being triggered that has helped me go, oh, this is a thing. Let, let's go right here. Me, myself, and I, let me explore and hang out with this thing for a little bit and really feel it in my body and see what it is that I'm thinking about this. And I like that you pointed out too, that this is a lifelong journey because for me, I've always been the type of person that's like, and then I'll be healed completely. And then I'm good. And I've accomplished this milestone. And now we're going to move on to the next one. And there's certain things that you do. You just kind of weed that thing out and you never think about it ever again. And you just move on. And there's other things that sneak up on you a little bit. And you're like, Oh, that kind of got me going. And I'm getting to this place now in my, as I'm getting older, where I don't really look to heal every single thing all the time. I just observe it and spend some time with it and say, is that hindering me from anything? Um, is there something I need to do more with that? Cause I feel like my body really helps share with me when it's time, but, but it takes me back to something that we talked about in our previous conversation, which was that you can have both. And your context that you were talking about in this situation was that you were saying that you can blush and be successful at work. You can blush or have rosacea or, or whatever that thing is that's causing you some insecurity and still go on a date and still get married and still have children. We get in this mindset that it's one or the other. And your, your statement was you can have both. It's important to measure success in a different way and not measuring it by if this thing happened or didn't happen. So what would you say to people that are doing that? What are some other ways that they can measure their success in those types of social situations? If they're only looking to, I didn't get anxious in this situation, or I didn't flush in this situation, they're kind of already setting themselves up for, for defeat there. (laughs) Yeah, that, that, that yardstick is not helpful because it's again, um, giving you it's rigid. It's saying, um, and as a perfectionist, and I get it, that feeling of, you know, you set the bar high of what you're expecting for yourself, but it makes it harder. It puts more pressure on you. So 
especially if this has been an ongoing challenge. Most people who struggle with blushing, flushing, rosacea, I mean, sometimes it happens just like very recently and it's a new concern. But if you're someone like me, or if you've struggled with this for years, to expect that you're going to show up and that it's just not going to happen at all is pretty unrealistic. Um, the other thing is with anxiety, the goal is never not to feel anxious. That's just not realistic. It's not helpful. And we don't want to get rid of anxiety. That's not the goal with it. So I like to, and actually I got this from another person I connected with on Instagram. Her motto, her life motto is show up scared, show up anyway. So you're not measuring yourself by the outcome of did you blush? Did you flush? How did you look? Whatever. It's more so did you do it anyway? Did you follow through with what you wanted to do? And just like you said, observing, how did it go? Did anything surprise you? Giving yourself credit for just doing the thing anyway. Um, and we're too hard on ourselves. Humans are so hard on ourselves about how it has to be, how it has to look, how it has to go. And um, I do think that it is really healing to just say, it's going to be there with me. That's kind of like um, one of the modules that I la I labeled in my course is befriending anxiety because, um, you know, this is a part of you. This is going to be there. There's a very high correlation between blushing, flushing, and being anxious, and rosacea, and being anxious and having anxiety. And it's a two-way relationship. It's really unclear how, what is impacting what first, but to try to push it away and get rid of it and say, you know, I'm going to be a success and I'll feel good if I just get through an interview and not blush at all. That's not that just seems so limiting, especially if it's such a, um, if it's been such an ongoing struggle. And I would say a more helpful goal or intention you might set is a little more flexible and saying, even if I flush, I'm still able to get through it and I'm able to feel free to, to express myself and be myself and I'm not as distracted by it. Or was I able to kind of, you know, not duck out early to this event or was I able to show up to the date and actually have a good time? You know, like how um, was I able to be mindful when I was eating, sitting across from someone, even though, I mean, I know that was something I would deal with. If I was getting red, I would just be so focused on that. I wouldn't even probably even taste what I was eating. So um, we want to expand on what our intentions are to be more aligned with what is the end goal here? When people are getting into a place of, we talked about those trigger points, like when you you said for you, it's heat. The same thing happens for me. I can feel it. It's like a all of a sudden the heat hits me and I know I'm about to start flushing. And the what I'm aware of is that my mind almost like immediately goes, protect yourself, flush more, <laughs> it's whatever's happening. And I've gotten myself to a place by practice, by just showing up and doing it and going through it so many times. And you work through some of that discomfort to where I can feel it. And it's not so loud, but it's there, but it, it kind of startles me. And then I'm able to become very aware of what's going on and what's happening in the room and put my focus back on, usually it's in a conversation on the person and, and breathe to let my nervous system know we're safe. I know you just got like all riled up. Like we need to protect me. Thank you. I appreciate you. This is all inner in internally yes. happening in the moment. Like, thank you so much for loving me so much, but we're good. Basically settle down. And I just let myself start to shift back out, but that has taken practice. Oh, I had to keep putting myself in situations over and over and over again, where that is happening. And, um, when for people who are getting those trigger points or having that thing that, that they, they feel hits them, what, if the fight or flight reaction is happening in the body, you talked about this on our last a video you you talked about how normal the fight or flight reaction is and it's there as it's we we love it we we wouldn't be alive without it but when it's when it's really hypersensitive when it's running its course i've always been told that it has to run its course once it's triggered it needs to run its course you can't stop it midstream you've got to let it go through the process number 1 is that true and number 2 when people are feeling that ramping up in their system what are some things they can do to ride that wave with it instead of feeling like 
that consuming panic that a lot of people feel. Yeah. I don't know if that's accurate that once it starts, you can't stop it. I don't know if that's scientifically proven, but I would say the effort to try to stop it just makes you more overwhelmed. It's like saying part of why when people struggle with panic attacks, what fuels panic attacks is fear of the fear and not wanting to have panic and being so afraid of those sensations when they start. And so pushing that away, it truly just makes it harder for you and makes you more overwhelmed in the moment. So it's kind of like saying you're riding the wave, you know, it's coming. It's so uncomfortable and there's no way to sugarcoat it, but I would say you absolutely can bring the intensity down. If you're having, if you're triggered, you might not be able to to prevent that experience, but we can say, okay, acknowledging that right now you are being triggered, you feel unsafe. And like you said, there are certain mental things you can do, like saying certain things to yourself, like I am safe, I am protected, this feeling will pass, even though this is so uncomfortable, I've been here before, it didn't kill me and I got through it and I can get through it again. You know, there are mental things, but I've even heard people say that when you are that triggered, even talking to yourself like that really sometimes doesn't do much because your body is so tense and feeling unsafe that sometimes even our words can't really penetrate, right? So that is why the mind-body connection is so powerful. And truly, there are two ways you can intervene. You can intervene through your thoughts. You can soothe yourself through your thoughts and you can intervene through your behavior. So learning about the vagus nerve for me was really um, eye-opening. And the vagus nerve is something we all have as humans that can immediately, when we activate it or stimulate it, it can really help your body to feel calmer. And there are such simple things you can do. And when I say to you, you might think like, it just seems so basic, but really, I mean, I talked about cold. If you struggle with feeling hot is a trigger, you know, washing your face with cold water, drinking cold water, um, taking a cold shower, those can be calming. Um, the other thing is your vocal cords. You talked about the throat chakra. If you were to hum or sing or um, even gargle, stimulating the vocal cords can help you to feel safer and calmer. It tricks your body into feeling um, calm. I talked to um, slow, deep breathing. You know, when we practice deep breathing, it's kind of like if you were in a really um, unsafe situation, your body wouldn't be breathing slowly, right? You'd probably be having, sometimes we hold our breath when we're anxious. So if you notice that, that's why mindful breathing, slow, deep belly breaths that are, you know, from your diaphragm and really um, taking time to exhale, not forcing it, but just slowing it down. It tricks your body into thinking you are safe. So these are just some little techniques you can do. And then there are some tapping exercises, like just tapping both sides of your body. Even if you just, you know, um, this is called the butterfly hug. You could tap both sides here. If you're in a situation where you're around a lot of people, there are certain things, there are certain limitations where maybe you don't want to do certain things, but um, mindful awareness, bringing your attention to the reality of what's actually happening in your surroundings rather than what your imagination is creating, or like you said, just being triggered by the situation. We want to bring ourselves back to what's actually happening in the moment. Um, and it really does take practice. Just doing this once or, tw you know, in the moment during a crisis could help be helpful, but we we really want to create like your body coming back down to um, a lower level of a baseline anxiety. So that's why doing these exercises helps like daily um, rather than just doing it in the moment when we're so triggered. You're preparing for it, when you have to use them in those more heightened and sensitive situations. That's what I've found with meditation this past year has really been a learning opportunity for me with like more of meditation and some somatic work as well. I know that you on your Instagram do talk about things from a spiritual spirituality standpoint and 
I, I would love if you would share even just from your own experience or what you've witnessed or learned in regards to, like I talked about the energy systems in the bottom and, and the body and the throat chakra. And the two big ones for me was the root and uh, which is safe belonging, being included in an environment and the throat. And I found those to be two, the more research I've done, I'm definitely not an expert in this, but I like lion's, uh, lion's breath and doing different things in yoga have really helped me to know and to help, help me to kind of open up these energy systems and chiropractic care, functional neurology. I have a, um, it's the shoulder, the shoulder comes up all the time when I'm in more intense, been really busy at work, got a lot of things going on. I can look in the mirror and see the shoulder is up and just breathing and pulling it back down and talking to some of those care providers that, that really like to work more on energy systems in the body and talking about those releases in, in the system. So for people who are, they're down for therapy, they'll do that, but they really like grounding and meditation and, and visiting the the body as a whole. You talk about it sometimes, but I haven't done a lot of research into, into your thoughts and feelings around that. But, but what, what do you think about people actually tapping into their inner, inner world from, from like chakra chakras and, and energy systems. Yeah. I'm a fan of whatever works. There are so many different avenues to healing, um, acupuncture, energy work, astrology, um, you know, just becoming connected to the universe in nature, being mindful. So I think whatever works, each person is so different, but I, um, I love all those different modalities, massage, whatever helps you to release energy. I like to think of anxiety as an energy in your body, even with the blushing and flushing, like you've said, it's something's trying to come out. It's trying to be released. So how can we help it get out, um, or help it move through you, not forcing it, but just allowing it to be what it is. So, um, when I say when my spirituality really is a connection to the universe, looking at what is the lesson I can learn from this challenge? How can I not try to hide this? And how can I learn from it? And actually like, I mean, that's, I think been the biggest healing part is really, they say like a wounded healer is someone who really uses their struggle to help others and to help others to try to make sense of it based on their own healing journey. And so, um, Connecting the dots, like early dots with what's happening now, I think is one of, it's kind of like shadow work, which is something new that I've really explored also through creating this course is the parts of us that we hide is contains like our medicine, our healing. Like we need to befriend that part. We need to acknowledge it and understand where did that start? That shame, shame is so toxic. And so, um, you know, there are so many different avenues we can approach this issue, but I think using like an integrative approach, using holistic approach, it's not always about medicine. And I actually, it's, it's just interesting how people truly want to just get rid of this and want to just take a pill and make it better. But there's so much more there that we could actually enrich our self-understanding of who we are and use it in some way to benefit us and the people that we are around. If you're a healer or helper or a therapist, coach, you could use this to really inform your work with other people. I'm really excited about your course. So tell us about your offerings, courses, workshops. How do you help others? What do you have available? So really there's, I mean, I'm really narrowly now focused on this area. I am, it's not even narrow. I think it is an umbrella, but it is specific. So I recently launched a course. It's emotional healing for rosacea and chronic blushing. There is a real overlap between people who struggle with rosacea. I developed rosacea later in life. I had blushing for years and years, but um, there's a, usually a missing puzzle piece that when you go to the doctor, they focus on topically or medicine wise, or even um, just diet wise, what can help you with nutrition, which is all really important, but there's always an emotional piece of what's happening when something's impacting our body and it's persisting and it's not getting better. So this is a course that is self-guided, self-paced. 
It is um, seven modules. They're all like building blocks to help support your growth. And, um, you know, it contains skills. And I would say it's like going back to what you mentioned about self-worth, you know, that is also the common theme of helping someone all these building blocks. I help people in the course with building a more positive body image, with learning how to be more mindful, with learning how to be more self-compassionate, um, learning about the mind-skin connection and what that's all about and how it plays into managing triggers. And um, so all these are building blocks that are helping you to really heal from the inside out. Uh, the course is available on my website, askdocjulie.com or on my Instagram at askdrjulie. And um, you can add on a one-to-one -one coaching session with me specifically related to your you know, blushing or your um, experience with rosacea. And it really will help you to uncover blocks to your progress. And I'm really excited about this because this is the, this is the first course I've really developed that's based on really my personal experience and what's helped me. And also what I've seen has really been helpful to people who struggle with anxiety and struggle with low confidence because there's such an overlap here. So I'm excited to, to share this. Do you offer workshops as well? Or I know, I know sometimes you'll jump on Instagram and do some lives and um, have some gatherings for people. Yeah, so I won't be having any live workshops for a while, but I do have... Um, a whole range of workshops related to mindfulness for women empowerment. And these are every so often around Valentine's day, I do a self-love workshop and I do, I offer different lives, but I'm really focusing on the emotional healing for rosacea and blushing on Instagram. That's kind of my new area. So I know through you, April, a lot of people who struggle with blushing have found me through you, through YouTube. So I know how many people you're serving and truly, I know that this community is so much bigger than I, I had ever imagined. And I never, ever imagined talking about this publicly. It was like the one thing I always wanted to hide. And now I'm realizing how many people just feel so comforted by people talking about this and creating a safe space. So I know how many people you're helping by just connecting people with other people who they can relate to and look at and say, wow, if you struggle with this, then, you know, maybe there's hope for me or it's not so bad because I know there's so much pain in this area and so much shame. One of the things that I realized in our last video together was that I asked you, how do you react when people call it out or say something about it? And, and you said to me, you go, I don't really talk about it that much. And that was when you were first starting to talk more openly about it. So in the past two years, and just hearing about the course that you've created and the, the direction that your work has gone, do you just look at your life and go, how did I, I end up here? And how has that helped you to be able to talk about it more openly? Because you talk about it extremely openly now you created a course around it so how has that helped you yes but it's different I do remember when we talked about it you were more so saying you know when people I, I really it wasn't the focus of my work because um I had different areas that I was really focused on helping people with and so commonly I would go on live and I'd become very red and very flushed and I would ignore it and I would just allow it to be what it is and it did not stop me and I would say that really represents my healing process that I'm still doing everything I want to do with the blushing, with the flushing. It goes away. It comes back. It is what it is, but I'm still showing up as me and I'm not letting it stop me. However, I've now been able to use it in a way where I'm really helping target people who struggle in this area, which I was not doing before. So I am more openly showing it, talking about it, but I'm also not, it's different where I still truly believe if you're someone listening right now who struggles with this, and I have many people who contact me who say that at work, they're so self-conscious, they're hiding, they have, you know, they, they're they having a really hard time. You never owe anyone any explanation of anything that's happening to your body or your appearance. You don't need to focus on it outwardly. You don't need to explain it to anyone. What I used to tell people, because I had a boundary up, would be, I think I might be allergic to something. I'm having a reaction. I'm overheated. I'm my I'm sensitive to clothing. So I'm getting red because I'm wearing it. Whatever it is, you don't need to label it as erythrophobia. You don't need to say you're having struggles with blushing. 
it's nobody's business if you don't want to talk about it publicly. April and I are at a point where we are using this as um, as an avenue to really dehumanize and take away the shame from this. So we are being very out there and talking about it to empower you that you don't need to let it get in your way, but you absolutely don't owe anyone an explanation about any of this. So I, I do still truly believe to have boundaries in this sometimes is protective and is important. And I know, I think you've mentioned too, that people were surprised to hear that you dealt with this when you started talking about it. And I'd say people, because I've dealt with it for years and years, people knew it, but I never really shared it outwardly. And yeah, I'm putting words to it. But again, I just want to say we always need to be able to be in control of what we share and how we share it. If if it makes you comfortable, go for it. If it helps your healing process, go for it. And if not, that's totally okay too. I think that is so incredibly empowering because that comes down to the comparison factor of you see people openly talking about it or creating YouTube channels or podcasts or whatever, and feeling like you have to do that too. That may not be what your journey looks like. For some people, it's that they want to get back on a stage and sing a song. And that, that's what they love to do. And they've put that away and tuck that away for years because they feel like they're embarrassed and they know they're going to turn red. And for some people, it's just showing up to work. And that's why I've really started to move our channel into a place of whatever resonates with you, take it. And whatever doesn't just leave, leave it be. It, it doesn't have to be for you. So I'm so glad that you pointed that out. The thing that I love about your course, and I know we're getting ready to wrap it up here, but from the time that I've spent in, in taking a look at the course, diving into it a little bit, is it really comes down to that self-worth element. And for me, this whole journey has led me to self-esteem and, and self-consciousness. So being able to explore more about lack of self-worth, diving into self-esteem and self-consciousness, because the self-consciousness was that obsession I remember looking on my phone, like, what does it mean when you're just like, so overly focused on yourself? And the first thing that popped up on Google was like narcissist. I was like, no, no, not that. What else is there? <laughs> and it was like self-conscious. And again, in my world, those, those, um, the vocabulary of that didn't make sense in my mind because I thought meek, mild, and that is not at all what it, what it means. Self-conscious doesn't necessarily mean that you're a more shy or quiet person means you're literally constantly thinking, overly thinking about yourself in every situation. And I never explored that because I didn't know that that's what it was. I didn't know the terms. So sometimes just realizing the terms. And I think we get so focused on urethrophobia, urethrophobia and blushing that I've even realized when I look at some of like the analytics on the backside of blushing Phoenix, that people are utilizing the, the, that space almost as as a, uh, as a web browser where you're just like a Google search there, you're looking to get a little more information to get educated, but you're looking for a product or appeal. And if you, if you really want to dive deeper and get into that, the soil of, of, of this thing, spending some time in self-esteem and your modules are put together so well and so clear and so easily digestible as well. And the fact that it's self-guided. So I'll make sure that I post all of that in the description box, as well as your website where people can go out there and make sure that they follow you on Instagram because you post so much great stuff. That's so encouraging. Dr. Julie, thank you so much for your time today. This has been such a treat, such a pleasure. I had a whole list of questions. I was like trying to like find like, well, we're, we're running out of time. Which one do I want to ask now? So thank you for always being so willing to spend some time with me and, and help the people that are going to stumble upon this. And, and I know it's going to be so impactful for them. Is there any final things you'd like to say before we close out? Just that truly you've been a gift to me and you've inspired me to, to talk about this in a different way. And I know it's helped people. I know your openness and you kind of holding the torch and leading the way has helped people in ways that you wouldn't even realize. And I know for me, you never realize how much something, you know, something you've worked through these steps. There's so many little steps we have to take to get here, but even one of those little steps can open up someone's life in so many ways, being able to just show up and have an experience or talk to someone or be more present. It's like an invaluable skill. So do, you know, I just, I want to thank you for inviting me, but also just that I'm so grateful that we connected and that this is a new community that we can kind of help together. So 
I'm so glad to be a part of this. I am so excited about Dr. Julie's course that she's put together for people who are struggling with urethrophobia, chronic blushing, rosacea, and overall self-esteem. She spent a lot of time putting together this very thorough seven module self-guided course. And I really hope that you'll take some time to go check it out. I absolutely trust Dr. Julie. I know that her heart is to help empower others. And I know that so many people will be liberated just by taking this course. Crowd gets rough Gotta stand up straight